it's really a hand-built lens. You know, you saw the traditional polishing today. We'll see the assembly. We'll see some assembly tomorrow. It's really a high craft, hand-built product, and we take great pride. You know, we think we just take great pride in everything we do here. And I am so proud of you know what Cook has accomplished in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, to go from a company that was you know virtually hang virtually almost dead to being what I think is an industry leader today um, with all, with the range of products we have, which I think is broader than any other company in the services of the industry. Thank, thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, to, uh, to receive me, to your time, uh, and, uh, to, to let me uh, make a, a small trip uh, in, uh, inside your um, uh, factory. So, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to come all this way from Milan. Yeah. That's, so. The cook look. Uh, which is your secret uh, f for those <laughs> lenses? <laughs> if I told you, I'd have to kill you. So I won't tell you. You're, you seem like a nice guy. But, you know, cinematographers, if you go to the Cook website, we have quite a few. We ask cinematographers all the time to tell us what the Cook look, what they think the Cook look is. And while they all say it in different words, they all say about the same thing. It's, it's warm, it's flattering to skin tones, it's roughly what you see with your eye, color, and um, has a great fall off of focus. Some people call it, uh, uh, some people call it roundness, you know, so give the dimensionality. Mm -hmm. um, the only word I really hate when people sometimes use is soft. You know, the eye can confuse Con, uh, contrast for mm -hmm. resolution. So some of my competitors go goose the contrast far higher. And you look at their lenses and you say, ooh, look at that resolution. But you're not looking at resolution, you're looking at contrast. If you look at it, you know, in, in today's world, if you look at a, our lens and versus somebody else's lens of the same focal length, and you look at it in Photoshop, per se, you'll see that there's generally more information, more resolution in the Cook lens. Because they not, nothing comes for free in optics. So by goosing, by taking out the contrast, you actually lower the amount of detail you get that you'll resolve. So we think, obviously, we think we found the right balance. Obviously, my competitors think they found the right balance. And all this is good for you mm -hmm. as a cinematographer. Uh, although I think Cook is right for every movie ever made, that's probably not right. You know? And so if you, if you think of the lenses as your paintbrush, mm -hmm. you know, as for some movies, Cook is the ideal lens. For other movies, maybe another brand has the right color and feel for your movie. Uh, I've done many interviews to uh, many directors of photography, mm -hmm. and usually uh, they choose uh, lenses speci specifically for their project. So as the way it should be. What really has, um, if you've seen some of my other interviews, you will know one of my one of my pet peeves with the industry right now is that we seem to think the end that what I call the tail is wagging the dog. And that is, the engineers that make these decisions for Sony or Canon or Airy are setting the technology and, and, and cinematographers are saying, oh, there's a new camera, there's a new lens, there's a new this. I have to use it on my next project. That's not the way that you should do it. Mm -hmm. The technology has sort of become all-consuming for too many people, not everybody, but a lot of people just think about the technology when they should be thinking, What's the best way to tell this story? And if it turns out it's high tech, great. If it turns out it's using Super 16, that's great too. What's the best way to get the story? 
uh, and what will tell it the best. If you make the right decisions, and it's a good story, mm -hmm. it'll all take care of itself. You know, there, there's this big thing in the industry right now between, you know, HD, 2K, 4K. <clears throat> uh, I think Amazon just announced they're going to be requiring 8K. <sighs> <laughs> It's all bullshit. You know, it's marketing shit. Uh, if you make all the right decisions for your story, whether you shoot it in 1K or 8K or a gazillion K, it'll work. Ultimate resolution does not necessarily make a picture anybody wants to see. And generally, it doesn't make a picture anybody wants to see. When, when, we went to two, when we went to HD, and then to 2K, and then to 4K, what's one of the first things people did shooting? They went, they said, wow, this doesn't look very good. We want to go with, with old Cook Speed Pancros or other old, all other old vintage lenses that didn't have the resolving power of today's lenses. And why did they do that? Because the cameras weren't telling the story in the way they want it. In the old days, in the film world, it would have been really simple. You know, you pick the lens, you pick the film stock, you could do a lot of tricks with your film stock at the lab. There was a lot more control. Now, if the, if the cinematographer wants to get his look in the can and not necessarily do it in po somebody else do it in post, he's got to make he's got to make he's got to get what he wants. Because oftentimes, in the old days, usually the cinematographer, at least in the States, and I think over here too, would stick with the job from, he'd be there at, at what they call now pre-visualization and all that stuff, and the storyboarding, he'd obviously shoot the film, he'd, he'd oversee the processing at the lab, and he'd be there when they did the printing at the end. So he could make sure that his vision was carried out throughout the film. Mm -hmm. Now, more often than not, the cinematographer shoots the film, and then he's off to another job. And, so, and then the, then the uh, post people get involved, and the special effects people get involved. We had one film that had, was going to be a beautiful film, should have been a beautiful film. And we had already done, we'd worked with the, the cinematographer, we, had, we already had a, an article done. And then he, then he, but he was he he wasn't in there for all those processes. So when he finally saw the rough cut, at, toward the end, mm -hmm. he said he can't publish this article. The film doesn't look anything like I wanted it to, because all those people that came after him have the ability now to alter the images and alter them a lot. So you know we we, we threw. You know that article away because he didn't want his name associated with it anymore because it didn't have it wasn't it was no longer his vision. I travel probably six seven months a year all over the world, and I talk to a lot of people. Uh, I talk to cinematographers. Uh, I also talk to a lot of the rental house. Mainly our main customer is really the rental house. Mm -hmm. Well, our real customer is the cinematographer, but we sell most of our gear to a rental house. So I talk to both of those. Uh, both of those people and try to figure out what people are asking for and you know, then come back here and sit down with my engineers and designers and say, let's do this. Um, you know, a good example was, anim uh, you know, we introduced Anamorphic f four or five years ago now, I can't remember, mm -hmm. and it's been wildly successful. When I took over the company 21 years ago, people have been asking me to do anamorphic right from the very beginning. But in the film world, in the pre-digital world, anamorphic was really something that was owned, high-end anamorphic was owned by Panavision. They have great lenses, they have the whole system, and shooting anamorphic in film is more difficult than it is in, in uh, digital. Mm -hmm. Well, when digital came out, it was like, wow, the moment is here. Because the market went from, in the film world, the market was very small. All of us, meaning Ari and Zeiss and us and Anjano and Red. Well, no, Red didn't make a film camera. Aton, uh, you know, uh, 
all, all the film gear really funneled through a few hundred rental houses around the world. Yes, we sold to private owners. Yes, we sold to schools. But our primary customer was the rental houses. Mm -hmm. uh, and there weren't many, there weren't that, for, a, for an industry that has such a big perception in the, in, in the, in the world, really a small business, you know. We had two or three hundred customers worldwide that serviced all the movies. That's really small. So... Extremely we, small. Yeah. 200, 300. Two or three hundred. I mean, you know, we're talking about, again, back in the film world, we're talking things like Denny Claremont, Otto Nemitz, over here Joe Dutton, uh, Movie Tech. Uh, you know, we're talking the bigger rental houses around the world. And they're not many. There really aren't that many. And in the pre digital days, there really weren't very many. Digital, digital changed the equation. So we went from two or three hundred rental houses and Panavision being the king of anamorphic to this, almost overnight when Red came out. Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, anybody, everybody is a rental house, whether they, whether they were just a guy with a camera or a production company. All of a sudden, the, the, the Red made digital and pioneered by Red, made, democratized the mm -hmm. business a lot. So all of a sudden we went from two or three hundred customers to tens of thousands. And as I said earlier, what we noticed right away about digital, it was, it, it took the character, it was too sharp. And digital is a great format, but it's, it, but it's boring and sterile on its own. Mm -hmm. And so cinematographers recognize this. And what did they try to do? They tried to put character and personality into what they were shooting. They did it by putting 300, you know, a pro mist on the front of the, on the lens. They did it by using old lenses. They did anything they could to knock the edge off the, 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 the look of the video and how sterile it looked. Anamorphic mm -hmm. is a great way to do that. I mean... By definition, traditional anamorphic has very interesting distortion. It's warping in, in several directions because an anamorphic is really two lenses in one. Vertically, it's, it's a, let's just say it's a 40 millimeter lens, mm -hmm. a normal 35 millimeter, super 35, normal 40 millimeter lens. But horizontally, it's really a 20 millimeter lens that we, using cylindrical optics, we squeeze to fit in the four by three negative, right? And then in the film, in film, then you, it stayed that way until you projected it. That's how you unsqueezed it. Well, digital is great. I would imagine you're probably young enough. You've never seen. You never shot anamorphic film. Never shot. Hmm? Never shot. No. So you've never really seen a squeezed image. The only place in digital that the image is squeezed is on the sensor. But you flip the little switch, and everything you see you know, on your monitors and everything is de-squeezed. Mm -hmm. But on the sensor, that's really exactly what happens, just like in the film, the image is squeezed. And, but now, instead of projecting it to de-squeeze it, you flip a switch and it electronically de-squeezes it. So you see it in true size and shape. In the film world, you never saw it true size and shape until you projected it. So all the cutting, all the editing, all that was always done. I mean, I lose about 60 pounds in, mm -hmm. in the squeezed anamorphic. <laughs> and trust me, I could lose 60 pounds. Um, but today's, today, you don't know that. Uh, and you don't see that, which is okay. That's what's made it so much easier to shoot anamorphic. And anamorphic, at least the way we executed it, keeps what I call... I call the look of anamorphic, true anamorphic, like if you look back to the pan, old Panavision lenses, I call that, I call the look sort of funky. Mm -hmm. you, uh, it's, the distortion is different than a spherical lens, the, the bulky is oval. It's just more, it's a more interesting image to look at. And now people sitting in the theater don't go, mm, yeah, that's, that's, that's an anamorphic. <laughs> but, the, but because of those differences, they sit there and somewhere back here in their brain, they're thinking, Hey, I like this movie, and you know what? It's more interesting to watch. I don't know why, but it's but it's but but you know they don't know it's anamorphic, but it's because the artifacts are different than what they're used to seeing. It's interesting. Uh, I've done an interview with uh, uh, an amazing DOP uh, 
from, uh, from Italy, uh, Gianfilippo Corticelli, okay. uh, uh, he won a um, David Donatello um, prize, and uh, he told me, uh, Luca, if you, if you make a picture like a, a, a portrait, okay, with spherical, with spherical lenses, and you project them uh, at the cinema, you say, wow, amazing. When you try with anamorphic, you say, wow, definitely better. And when you come back to spherical, you say, ah, no, I, I can shot again I, I, I with would, spherical. I, I, mean, I, I mean, he's the DP, I'm not a DP. But I, I would differ with him because, again, the story drives, should drive those choices. And I agree, anamorphic is a magical look to it. Uh, I've got some great things I can show you that, uh, mm -hmm. that illustrate that. But is it right for every story? Maybe, maybe. I mean, undoubtedly, it's not right for every story. Mm -hmm. um, but it is right for a lot of stories, especially now in the digital world, where it's so much easier to do. It was such a pain in film. And now, as I said, you don't really, most young people don't really understand what true anamorphic is because they never see that image squeezed. Mm -hmm. And you know, I said, when I travel around the world giving my lecture, one of the things that people are most interested in, we talk about lens making and all that, but the most, one of the things they're most interested in is when I get, start to explain how anamorphic really works, because they don't know. When we first introduced the, um, these lenses in Paris, at, I, think, I think it was 2013, 2014, I don't remember. It was at Micro Salon in Paris mm -hmm. back then. And we had shot in Paris, uh, you know, a week before a test, a, te a film that we then projected. And I got these questions from the film students in, that were in the audience, and I really didn't understand them until I thought about it later. I didn't understand them at the time. <clears throat> and they were saying, yeah, they look, the, the pictures look great and interesting, but how come the bokeh is, is not round anymore? And that wasn't exactly their words. If I, that, if that had been there, that's what they meant. Mm -hmm. And I really, I, I was at a loss until I thought about what they were asking. Because, I mean, these, are, these were the top film, I assume, I shouldn't assume, but I assume these guys were sort of the upper end film students in Paris, right? To them, or to this group, to them, anything that was shot in um, widescreen, mm -hmm. basically crop super 35, was anamorphic. No, that's widescreen. Anamorphic is using these particular types of lenses that compress and then decompress the image because doing that gets you wonderful artifacts mm -hmm. that make the image like your friend in yeah. Corticelli. Wow. Yeah, and it's, it's true. It's true, but is it right for every story? I would, I, I would argue with whether it's right for every story. But because digital is such a um, sterile and boring format, mm -hmm. it's certainly one way that cinematographers have to bring character and life into what would be a sterile and boring uh, image. So that's, um, that's, my, that's my story. For the cinematographer that work in cinema, uh, that um, leave the the, um, uh, the jump from uh, film to digital, so, um, Ari, I know that uh, um, engineering um, generalized the sensor to to be like um, transparent to uh, to give to the old cinematographer the sensation uh, to, to work with the film. Mm -hmm. So their sensor is uh, uh, almost uh, the same. So the color of the right. sensor, yeah. it's almost the same in each model. Right. Uh, in, it's the same things, it's uh, on your lenses that are, um, the, the, the color is, is extremely... Yeah, the, the, the cook look you know what but the end we didn't make up the phrase the cookbook actually in the, the cookbook is the, the industry made that phrase up and we grabbed it because it's great the cookbook has been consistent since the 1920s when we introduced the speed pancros and it all has to do 
But the recipe, the guys came up with almost, well, 100 years ago, just about, when, they, when, they, when we did the Speed Pancros. The first, up until sound movies, people shot with anything, even though we made motion picture lenses that go back to Thomas Edison and George Eastman in the, in the 1880s and 90s. Mm -hmm. And we made, we made specific lenses for a motion picture starting in about 1900. And they were used, they were, excuse me, they were very heavily used in Hollywood and here. But with this, when sound movies came in, all of a sudden things changed. Um, Pre-sound, how did they light sets? Well, if the set was outside, they used the sunlight. If the set was on a stage, they usually use, I mean, incandescent lighting, mm -hmm. as we know it today, didn't, it existed then, but it was pretty feeble. You know, it wasn't, you didn't have 1K, 2K, 10K, 18K lights. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way they produced really bright light in a studio was using something called a carbon arc. Um, and again, you're too young to, I actually ran carbon arcs when I was uh, a young. And carbon arc is exactly what it sounds like. You have an anode and a cathode of carbon, mm -hmm. and you then pump a lot of electricity into one side, and it jumps to the other side. And it makes a lot of light. It also makes a lot of noise, <laughs> and a lot of dirt and smoke. Well, mm -hmm. they didn't care about the dirt and smoke because the lights, they were high up. But obviously when sound came in, they couldn't use those, you couldn't use carbon arcs anymore to light. So they needed, inc they used incandescent lighting, which uh, obviously at, in the 1920s was pretty, pretty uh, pedestrian. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> Cook had just developed a set of lenses for the still world, because we used to build still, we used to build everything. And we had developed a, a series, a, a set of lenses called Series O. They were F2 for stills. Mm -hmm. Well, we reformulated those and they became the Speed Pancros. And we have letters in the file, in the archives, that say, basically, the speech pancros made sound movies t possible in the early days, because they were so fast. F2 back then, not T2, but F2, was really fast lens back then. Uh, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier of why coatings are so important. Mm -hmm. I know, I know we weren't talking on this tape, but we, when we were walking through the factory. And here's an example. Uh, a, a piece of glass, uncoated piece of glass, will reflect anywhere from 6 to 8% of the light that hits each surface. Each lens has an in and an out, so each lens has two surfaces. And if you do that math, and you have a 20-element lens, which would be like a small zoom, or a really complex prime, um, you would find out, if you do that linear regression, you find out you, at the back of the lens you're getting about 4% of the light out of the lens. 4%. 4%. That same lens, with modern coatings, I get 96% of the light out of that. <laughs> so it's huge. So if you think about 4%, it's a 1, 2, 3, 3 and a half, four, almost 4 stops, I think, right? 50, 25, 12 and a half, uh, six, a little four stops, call it four stops. It's a lot of light loss, right? Yeah. Uh, and the reason that we actually mark uh, lenses in P stops in the, for this industry and no other, mm -hmm. which you know is transmitted light, is that, the, is that the lab didn't care about the F stop. They had to know how much light actually got through the lens which is why we use T-stops. So that, you know, you, when, because the lab isn't on your shoulder like it is in, in video, right? The lab is somewhere else. So they had to know how much light actually got to the film. And then, because in those days, coatings didn't really come into use until about 19, late 40s, early 50s. So pretty much any lens built before 1950 is uncoated. So you can, you know, you can just think about that and that's, that's why a lot of the early lenses, mm -hmm. well, A, we, weren't, we didn't have the sophisticated tools we have now to design complicated lenses. But even if we could, we couldn't have gotten the light out the back to expose the film. 
So that's anyway, that's why we use tea stops. And then historically, we continue to use them. Even though today, because of coatings, the difference between F and T is very slight. You know, a, a T2 lens will be an F1.9, it'll be an F197. So, I mean, literally with the film stocks today, the difference between F and T makes no difference. But, and, and you might think, well, what do we actually need to know the F number? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Because all the calculations you do, like for depth of field, and, well, a lot of other things are based on the F number, not the T number. So, you need both. In which field the technology can help um, uh, your, your factory wow. your, to improve? So in which well, direction you know, are you going? Well, you know, physics is really unforgiving. So we make lenses. We have better machines now. We have better, pro we have better computer-assisted programs to help us design the lenses. In the old days, in the old days being like the 50s and 60s, and, and even into the 70s here, we had, there used to be a, a class of employees here called computers. Mm -hmm. They were usually women, um, and they sat in a room with, with log tables, with mathematical log table books, and they would basically trace the rays through the lens. And if, we, and if we designed a lens and we traced three or four hundred rays through it, that would be a lot. Today we design lenses and we can trace billions of rays through it in, well, billions is probably an over, but millions of rays we can tra tra uh, trace for it, trace through it to check the lens, you know, in minutes for hours. In, in, in the old days, they would spend weeks and weeks tracing rays and only do three, two or three hundred rays, you know, so big difference. The tools are a big difference. But material-wise, you know, we, we, everything we build is glass. We don't, we don't use any plastic. It's, it's not, we don't really think plastic elements are, while they're okay in um, some still lenses, for the quality for the quality that you're looking for, that cinematographers demand, we, we don't really think it's appropriate. Not yet. It may be in a couple of years. Um, but at the moment, we don't think it's appropriate. Um, and, you know, the material, in, in some ways, our, our choices of glass have gotten smaller instead of bigger. You think that, that sounds a little crazy. But the ga glass catalog, the you know the the way we come up with the cook look is we know what we know what it want, we know what it is and we know what it wants to look mm -hmm. like and we know it's it's part uh, you know it's part contrast and it's part resolution and it's part color you know so we look at all that and and the way we control the color is by picking the glasses you know every glass has an in, index of refraction for bending the light okay. but they also have different color characteristics some do you know you've got red green and blue mm -hmm. and, and some do green and blue well some do they do different different glasses do different things well mm -hmm. so by picking the right glasses we can then control the color that we get out of the back of the lens everybody thinks it's the coatings but if that were true the original speed pancros wouldn't have looked like cook lenses do today it's the it's really the glass choices that uh, determine Predominantly, the, co the color of the coating can have a little teeny influence on it, but not much. Um, so the tools, you know, the glass catalog used to be much bigger. Uh, the EU, in their, their ultimate wisdom, has decided to ban leaden glass. They banned, uh, we, used to use an, we used to use arsenic in glass to debubble it. To get to get the bubbles out of as it cools, to get the bubbles out. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you say arsenic to somebody, what do they say? Oh my God, it's a poison! You can't put arsenic in your glass. You know how much glass you'd have to eat to die of arsenic poisoning? Quite a bit. <laughs> and people don't generally eat glass, but because arsenic and it's a recognizable name, 
they banned arsenic in glass. And now we use an element that's actually far deadlier than arsenic. But it, if I say the name of the element to you, it's probably one you've never heard of. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't mean anything. So the banning of arsenic in glass was purely a PR. But it means the new, uh, the new element we use to debubble glass isn't as good as arsenic. So it means we throw away, just for a PR campaign, we throw away more material because somebody said, oh, arsenic is a poison. You know? Sometimes what they do is right. We mm -hmm. used to use a radioactive element in glass called thorium. And thorium would cause things to yellow over time. So if you look at a lot of old lenses, they turn yellow uh, because it's radioactive. Mm -hmm. It's not enough radiation to harm anybody. And everybody used it. It does help. It helps the index of refraction when they're when they're making the glass. So they were right to ban it, not because it was dangerous in the glass. It was dangerous to work the glass. You know, when you polish it and grind it, and you if you breathe that glass dust in, and it gets in your lungs, then then that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So they banned it. That was a good thing to ban, and that was banned years and years and years ago. But some of the some of the rules they put on now are just sort of silly. So we, what that means is the, the glass catalog from the glass, there are only a handful of optical glass manufacturers, and, and we all use them, Zeiss, uh, Ingenue, us. Mm -hmm. We all buy the raw material from the same companies. Uh, and that catalog of a number of glasses we can choose has actually shrunk over the, over the last 30, 40 years. Well, you buy the, the glass from the same factory? We are, there, are, there are a handful of optical glass manufacturers. We buy raw material. We buy the raw glass okay. from them. Then we grind and we polish it. And you know, all my competitors do pretty much the same thing. We used to, in the old days, really old days, like over 100 years ago, we used to actually smelt our own glass. Mm -hmm. For the most part, those days are over for everybody. I think, I think Canon maybe still smelt some of their glass. But um, for the most part, there's a company called Schott, there's a company called O'Hara, and a few others around the world that make the raw material for everybody. Last summer, uh, I um, have done a, a, a movie, a self-production movie um, about um, sci-fi sci and travel in mm -hmm. new time. Okay, um, extremely uh, cheap production. But, uh, we use uh, uh, the Canon CN8, okay? uh, and at the end, uh, the, um, the editor uh, and, and then the colorist says, Luca, never, never again with, with Canon, because there are too much difference uh, of uh, color and saturation, and uh, it's, the gap, it's... So, uh, but one of the reasons we have the Cook look is because our look for all of our product has been consistent from 1920s when we did the speed pancros. So the S4s, the S4s were our direct descendants from the speed pancros uh, when they were built. Now the direct descendants are really the pancro classics. Mm -hmm. But when we build, and, and the difference, basically the difference between a speed pancro, a pa there, there should be no difference between a speed pancro and a pancro classic. The pancro classic should look like the way the pan speed pancros look the day they came out of the box. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of them are in disrepair, they've discolored over time. So they're, you know, and, but the day it came out of the box, it probably looked exactly like a pancro classic does today. That was how we engineered them. When we did the S4s, we wanted to take, we, 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 we talked to a lot of people when we did the S4s. Um, and we talked to assistants. We talked to, first we talked to directors of photography. They had a big input on how we analyzed what kind of coverage and how we wanted the lens to work. The assistants had the biggest input. The whole ergonomic design of, of the S4s and mm -hmm. all the subsequent Cook lenses have used that basic ergonomic design. We're really, we came up to that, came up to that design by talking 
to assistants and finding out, because they're the guys that pick the ones up, they put it on the camera, they pull focus. So we asked them, and they, they were very clear what they wanted, and we built almost all of that into the S4, and, and as I said, subsequent lenses. We know we got it right because almost every manufacturer in the world has copied our design. It mm -hmm. really pisses me off, but I can't do anything about it. Um, but the S4s were the first to set, were really direct descendants of the Speed Pancras. The difference was, by talking to the, all those people, we said, you know, on the DP said, you know, the small off, of, the fall off on the Speed Pancras is a little bit much. On a Speed Pancro, it starts to fall off just as you come off axis. And they said, we really like a little bit more area. So what we did is we, you know, we took our frame, we drew a, a vertical line through the frame on the axis, and we rotated that. So now we had a circle in the middle of the frame, frame height, but a circle. And that became what we call the, the, the image height area. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we really work hard on, on modern cook lenses to make that a cl fair, really clean area, and then we let it. Then we let that the fall off come in to the edge. Uh, whereas the speed pan crow, the fall off started right in the middle, right as you get, got off axis, the fall off started. Um, the other the reason, and that's one of the reasons the the S fours are bigger than the Pancros, mm -hmm. because to get that image area clean, we needed a bit, we needed a bigger a bigger pieces of glass. Okay, so that's one of the reasons the lens grew. But if you look at some of them, they're still very small. Like the fifty millimeter is very small in that S four housing, but the assistants want it. They want it linear focus. I mean, linear iris. They wanted focus that would push the marks together at mm -hmm. the at close focuses and spread them out at long focuses. Because you know those old well, old lenses, you know, you had two feet, three feet, four feet, infinity, or a bunch of marks, you know, that that far apart. You can't pull focus. You get, you know, so um, they wanted the marks evenly spread and more marks. So instead of using a um, multi-thread design, which is what we had used previously and what Zeiss used up through, up to and including the Ultra Primes, we went to a cam design. And the cam, which is a track, and we can shape the track so we can make the lens focus. We can, so basically by, by shaping the track, we can move how the focus moves and we can, we can push the marks at close focus together, and we can spread them out at long focus. Uh, as again, I know we got it right because everybody's copied that, right? So um, they wanted the gears, people wanted the gears in the same place, so we mm -hmm. did that. People wanted a lens that they could hold. They didn't want it so big you couldn't put it in your hand, but they didn't want it so small that, you know, we'd end up with a scale that big. And so we came up with a 110 millimeter size which for most people they can comfortably hold in one hand. I don't recommend it. I always, <laughs> I always recommend you put two, two hands. hands. On the, but if you have to grab it, you know you can grab it with a hand. And unless you've got, you know, with an average size hand, you can you can hold that lens and you, you can be pretty confident you're not going to drop it. Mm -hmm. So these are all things that the assistants want, and they're all things you know that everybody copied. Great. Um, the DPs wanted the better coverage, and the assistants wanted. The, um, the ergonomics and the rental houses, we talked to them too. And they wanted a lens that was easily serviced. Mm -hmm. you, you know there are lenses out there that if they need even some, even sometimes simple service, it's really difficult to do in the field or it could take hours, like a day to service a lens. Well, cooks were built with service in mind, so you on, every, uh, on just simple cleaning that you have to do when every, any lens comes off of a rental, you can basically clean most cook lenses in an hour. So you get a set of eight lenses out back in the, you know, the evening before. They can go out on a job the next day, at the end of the next day. That's almost unheard of with mm -hmm. anybody else's lenses. So we really try to listen to all three of our main constituents, the DPs, the assistants, and the rental houses. 
And I think, you know, as I said, I think we really nailed it pretty good. Uh, it happens that uh, um, <coughs> um, DP says, uh, um, I like this distortion, I like this, um, you know, this uh, artifacts. This is too perfect. Uh, I prefer when uh, there was something strange. Well, you're describing, I mean, you just described anamorphic. I mean, some of the people that have built anamorphic lenses <clears throat> really, I don't think, understood. They built anamorphics into great engineering on them, but they look spherical. If you want an anamorphic to look spherical, why don't you just shoot spherical, right? I mean, that's much easier, much faster, much cheaper. The other approach is to do a rear anamorphic, you know, put, put the anamorphic elements on the rear. The reason that doesn't work is that that doesn't give you the, gives you the coverage, but it doesn't give you the anamorphic character. To get the character, you have to do the squeezing in front of the iris. Mm -hmm. So all of our lenses are front anamorphic. But to go to, you you know, go back to, you, you know, people always want what they can't have, right? <clears throat> if you remember, Air used to make a set of really sophisticated macro lenses. And I think around 1998 or something, or early, maybe earlier, they discontinued them. They discontinued them because nobody was buying them. As soon as they discontinued them, everybody said, oh, I need those macro lenses, you know? So uh, at Cook, we think the Cook look is the right compromise. It makes digital cameras look, it makes film cameras look really good. It makes digital cameras look cinematic. Mm -hmm. um, for all the reasons that we were talking about earlier about what the Cook look is. Um, the color's right, the contrast is right, the fall off, the, the way we handle the fall off of focus, all that just works really well mm -hmm. and makes people look good. And at the end of the day, you know, most people on film want to look good, whether it's shot in digital or shot shot on film. So, and so we're not trying to build a scientifically perfect lens. We're trying to build a lens because we've been in this industry from the beginning. Uh, while Zeiss has been in it, not while well, Zeiss is slightly older than us, they really didn't get pulled into the motion picture world until about the 50s. Mm -hmm. People use their lenses, but they didn't, didn't make a, a product for it. We've been making motion picture lenses since the turn of the last century. So we have a lot of experience and a lot of feedback. Um, just to put that a little, one little story, we'll put that in mm -hmm. perspective. So do you know how the, the original Technicolor process worked? The original, uh, no. Uh, okay, you know, know how the three, you know how the three, a uh, three tube or three chip video camera works. Okay. So you have a red, a red channel, a green channel, and a okay, blue channel, yes, right? Sir. Three different chips, or three different. In the early days, they were three different tubes, but doesn't matter. So, the original Technicolor was called a, it was a three strip process. They had a three strips of black and white film. Mm -hmm. Red filter, green filter, blue filter. And they'd expose that, and then they developed the negative, black and white negative, that they would then dye. And they'd make, uh, then they'd put all that together to make a, a, color, a color master. Mm -hmm. Nobody could figure out how to make those lenses because usually, well, you know, here's the, here's the back of the lens and here's the film or the, or the sensor. <clears throat> well, in a three strip camera, we now go through prisms and mirrors and beam splitters, and the, you know it's back here now. How do you make a lens that can take whatever wide angle lens we or whatever lens we have on the front, and then make that travel through all those things and get to the film, you know, a foot away now, mm -hmm. and still give us the image we want? Nobody could figure that out. In the 1930s, when they came up with this process. The Technicolor engineers sent their guys to cook, and we invented a whole new, uh, a whole new design of lenses that's still used today. Um, it's called, it was called the inverse telephoto, but we invented that here, mm -hmm. you know, and solved that problem. I find it definitely amazing that uh, there is so much uh, mathematic, physics, science behind. Uh, something that DPs uh, um, just feel.
Yes. You know, just yeah. e e emotions. And, 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 and that's why we don't want to make a perfect lens. I mean, other companies have different ideas, which is fine. Uh, but at the end of the day, we want to give s cinematographers the tools they need to tell the story. We think, you know, we think we do the best of that. And, but again, right tool, right, right story, right tool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what I was saying earlier. The tail is wagging the dog. Me. There's a great piece on Cook TV. Uh, uh, you, you know, it's uh, by Jeff Boyle, mm -hmm. and it's called "Bleep the Numbers." I don't know if you've seen that one, but it's a great piece that everybody should watch. I really recommend CookOptics.tv. Jeff Boyle, "Bleep the Numbers." Uh, it, it, he really uses it's really f the numbers, but we decided that was a little bit too strong for the Cook TV audience. So um, he talks about pretty much what I've been talking about mm -hmm. with, with, with technology, and he and he shows um, and he throws 2K, 4K, 8K. Forget all that. How do you tell the story? And he and he and he takes a look at paintings. And he says, okay, what's the resolution? What's, you know, what's the color space of this? What, you know, and these are all paintings that sold for, you know, $20 million or more. So, I mean, they're, they're masters, Rembrandts, and, you know, so forth and so on. And, and um, lots of, anyway, watch it. And then, you know, and he talks about, um, you know, everybody wanting narrow depth of focus. but. Then he shows you a picture where everything's in focus, mm -hmm. but there's no doubt your eye is drawn exactly to what you should be drawn to. You're not searching around looking for what's in focus. I mean, look, you, your eye is drawn exactly what the photographer wants you to see because he knows how to do his business. And, and Jeff's point is, get the right picture that tells the story. Forget about all the technical crap. But You've got to learn your craft. If you don't really understand your craft, you're not going to make it. And it takes it it's, takes a long time. You know, in the old days, again in the film world, there was a real apprentice system for directors of photography. What did they do? They got out of film school or or just picked it up and they started working at a rental house and they were cleaning cases. And then somebody said, Well, you're working hard. Start working on the prep floor. So mm -hmm. they'd start working on the prep floor, and then somebody, one of the one of their one of the people doing a setup, would notice, "You're working pretty hard. Come and be my nineteenth assistant." And then you know, then they they'd work up to be a first assistant, and then they work up to be an operator, and then a DP, and they do that, and all along the way, they're they're absorbing, just an immense amount of knowledge from their peers, right? It doesn't really it doesn't really work that way anymore, does it? You know, people go to film school and say, "Okay, I'm a director, I'm a DP, I'm mm -hmm. a this, I'm a that," and and so we, I I think I'm an old guy, so this is the way I I sort of think. But I really think a lot has been lost to the younger generation because they don't have that the mentorship of their older peers. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't they don't do it step by step. They come out of school and say, um, I, "I'm sorry, I don't want to clean cases. I'm a DP," and 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 some of them are brilliant. You know, some of the young DPs are brilliant, but a lot of them um, they don't understand what exactly is right. I mean, maybe they can frame, but framing isn't all of it. I mean, the co composition of the the composition of that frame, and knowing how to use the light, you know. I remember when digital came out. Everybody said, "Oh, great! I don't have to light anymore." Well, that's bullshit, right? You have to. I mean, lighting is the key. Obviously, framing and having a good eye, but lighting is the key to getting it right. And and I've always said, if you can light, you can shoot in any format, and then you can make it look really spectacular. And if you can't light, and you get the shot, it's just luck. And, but I think, you know, today's world, everybody wants to take a shortcut. Mm -hmm. So, what can I say? Les, we are near uh, to, to the end of this okay. interview. After this um, 
uh, small visit this factory I've seen uh, more than 100 uh, people working hard uh, a lot of uh, young people and after this uh, trip uh, now I think that your products are not so expensive like uh, I suppose before thanks <laughs> I mean uh, when you, when you finish tomorrow you'll see these these are it's really it's really a hand-built lens you know you saw the traditional polishing today we'll see the assembly we'll see some assembly tomorrow it's really a high craft hand-built product and we take great pride you know we think we just take great pride in everything we do here and i'm so proud of you know what Cook has accomplished in the last 20 years mm -hmm. uh, to go from a company that was, you know, virtually hang, virtually almost dead, to being what I think is an industry leader today, um, with all with the range of products we have, which I think is broader than any other company in that services the industry. Um, so, uh, hopefully, as long as I'm here running it. We'll keep, we'll keep, we'll continue to try to live up to the promise of giving you what you need when you need it in a high quality product. Just uh, the last question, okay. question uh, could be this. How do you figure out uh, the, the next 10 years? That was easier 10 years ago, um, or 20 years ago when I took over. His film was very slow moving and we started with four S4s, and over that 10 years, it grew to 18 S4s, because the industry said, we love the S4s, but we need a 65, we need a 21, we want to, you know, so that, that grew. And we're still selling S4s today. I mean, they're, 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 even though they're 21 years old, I think they've pretty much become the standard of the industry. Um, how do we determine what next? And now it's a real nightmare because the cameras are moving so fast and we have to keep up with them. Mm -hmm. The large format cameras are here, they're here to stay. Um, this is one of the few times in the industry where I think we had the lenses out, the S7 lenses out before the cameras were actually ready. And we didn't do that with any, none of the manual camera guys came to us and said, Les, why don't you build some full frame lenses because we're coming out with a camera. We did it because we heard the same rumors that everybody heard. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, if these cameras, we're sure the cameras are coming out because, you know, all the rumors are floating around. So let's take a shot and build the S7s. And we did, and it turned out to be the right thing to do. Um, the anamorphics, as I said, we, we did the, started doing anamorphics because of digital. People have been asking us to do this for years and years and years, but it made no sense when the market was so small and Panavision really owned it. In the old days, with the film world, it was really simple. Uh, as I said, you know, we, we did, we did, we did. People were asking us from the day I bought the company to do anamorphics, but when the market was so small, it, was, it made no sense. Trying to compete with Panavision was just not an option. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could have built them, but nobody would have bought them. They would have, uh, they couldn't break into it. Digital comes in, takes a little market and thinks it's this big. Digital being a sterile and, you know, boring format, calls out for stuff like anamorphic. It made all the sense in the world. And we took the plunge very quickly, and it's been brilliant. I mean, the, the lenses now are making a lot of big movies. You know, are shot on our on our stuff and TV shows because now TVs are sixteen by nine, mm -hmm. which isn't quite right for anamorphic, but still close enough that commercials, TV sh series, uh, a lot of movies are all shot and they're shot on our lenses. I mean that Panavision is still shooting a lot of stuff too, but all of a sudden they have some real competition. Um, so. The, the industry is moving so fast. The S7s, we were a little bit ahead. Nobody, you know, they didn't give us a heads up, we're gonna do this camera. It was just the same rumors everybody heard. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you determine what's next? Well, we're already working on the next few years projects. And 
what I didn't know 21 years ago when I bought the company is how crazy and insane manufacturing is. It's crazy business, especially this business. I have to guess right now, two or three years in advance, for what we're going to have. And, the, and in the film world, that was pretty easy because, the, the, you know, it didn't change. Mm -hmm. it, really didn't, it really hadn't changed for 100 years uh, until digital came out. Um, now, you know, we have a new format every month. New this, new that, new... It just, it just doesn't end. Um, you have to explore a new format. Well, you know, I, 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 I have a different opinion about that. Mm. Um, yes, full frame is here to stay, but full frame is something... I don't remember, other than one or two people that are remain nameless at the moment, asking for full frame. There was not an outcry from DPs around the world. Super 35 just isn't good enough. We need full frame. We, and it, it, that, that didn't exist. There, there was no outcry for a new format. I think the camera manufacturers, well, A, Sony and Canon, mm -hmm. and, and Panasonic obviously make full frame sensors because they made you know, digital 35s. But I think they just were looking for a way that they, they, they thought they probably had saturated the Super 35 market and saw, you know, could see not ending of sales, but diminishing sales. So what do you do next? You introduce a, new, a, a totally new format. Uh, and it's been embraced uh, by, you know, a, a number of people. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't set the world on fire like the manufacturers thought it would. I think because nobody was asking for it. I still think 75, in, as long as I'm here at Cook, so I don't know, hopefully that's another 20 years, but who knows? As I said earlier, I'm an old guy. Um, I still think 35 is going to be 75, 80% of the shooting. 80%. I could be wrong. I mean, I hope I'm wrong, because it means I would sell a lot more lenses if it's if, if that number is higher. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for the foreseeable future, the, uh, the 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 full frame will occupy 20, 20, 25 percent of the market. Because thirty super thirty five, nobody was sitting in a major release on Leicester Square or or the equivalent in Milan. Mm -hmm. Nobody's sitting watching these giant screens watching stuff shot on the Alexa or, or stuff shot on Super 35 saying, gee, I can, see, I can see the light between the pixels. You know, this is really terrible. Nobody was saying that. Nobody was complaining about the, the, the ability of film or, you know, the, the HD slash 2K mm -hmm. cameras to deliver the pictures. I mean, look at all the films, even after the 4K cameras out. What are most films continue to be shot on the Alexa? Not the LF, just the Alexa. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, unless it's for next Netflix, people are shooting on the Alexa and they're making beautiful pictures, right? So again, the, the driver of, uh, I, and to a certain extent, the driver of large format and full frame is, you know, Netflix. Mm -hmm. They're not specifying full frame, but they are specifying 4K. And now with Amazon saying, we want our stuff in 8K. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you know, these cameras come out and people put old speed pancros on them to make them look cinematic, to make them look like there's personality and, and, and character. I said earlier, ultimate resolution does not make, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily make and generally does not make a picture that anybody wants to watch. And if you don't keep their eyeballs on the screen, you've lost. Les, thank you very much <laughs> for your time. Oh, my pleasure. And for your I, words. I, I, I enjoy it. Um, it's really precious for um, for my project uh, in in Italy to try to to spread this knowledge uh, about 
uh, lenses and about uh, the culture on make cinema. So my th pleasure. Thank you again.